because uh, the headache was that I had always thought that one needs to integrate other disciplines in macroeconomics and that I thought I might see an opportunity to do that, so I readily agreed to give a paper. But then when I wanted to execute the thoughts that I had that I thought would take me two weeks out of the summer, they turned out to be a, take a little longer. So, but I appreciate being fruitful the linger, and I leave it to you to pass a judgment as to whether it was worth my time. <coughs> So I start with actually slide 11, because I, you know how it is, it's imperfect knowledge, so since I'm attending the conference, I want to connect with what was said, and actually what Ricardo said was really interesting, I thought, because I sympathize with many of these things, and it's only because he didn't put one commandment there, which I can reveal at the end if you ask me, that I actually would pass all the things. I don't pass one commandment, but you will figure out which one it is from the talk. But he didn't put it on, so right now I'm a member of the church. Uh, so, the first question we want to ask is, so we had all these great talks, right? And these are all extremely interesting research from family to brain to social interactions to this and that and the others. So if you ask somebody who is not an economist, like people here, they say, this needs to be in. Everybody says, it needs to be in. And, some, and, then, and then people say, oh, this economist, they don't put it in because they're very obtuse. They, they, really, they really have a tribe. They, they don't want it. And uh, uh, you know, they want to maintain, they also have barriers to entry. It's all mathematics. So they, they want to make sure that there's no insurrection here from the outside. And, 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 and so on and so forth. So to the extent that they will deviate, they'll have the agent-based models that are just a complicated way of doing the same models, just having every person represented, and on and on and on. And I want to give a different answer to that, and that will be a starting point. That's why I start from slide 11. So I would say the following. Few observers, including economists, would object to anything that was said in this conference. I am an economist, I've been a critic of conventional economics for decades, I interact with a lot of economists, I work in a department that I think is pretty good with people who are well known. All of the people that I work with are intelligent, they understand all of these things. So why is it that they don't do it? And is there a, an answer, or maybe there is a the answer? And what I want to suggest is that there is the answer. And the answer is very simple. Once you think about the answer, and that's what I'll argue. So what is the, the answer? The answer is that once you suppose that you can represent the world with a stochastic process, you cannot bring any of these other people in if you want to be a reasonable economist. So the next <laughs> elephant in the room is who is the reasonable economist? A reason that's, that's the commandment that was implicit. A reasonable economist is an economist who does not suppose that market participants, or for that matter, any other people, do not pursue their goals forever and ignore the possibility of doing so forever. That economists do not do. They consider this gross irrationality. And what I will persuade you very quickly, I mean, the paper is long and should be longer, that to bring any of these fantastic insights in, into what is considered disciplinary consensus in economics, economists have to, will have to assume that people are grossly irrational. So it's the first part of the talk. The second part of the talk will argue that if you want to keep rationality in a reasonable way, I'm going to argue against bounded rationality. I actually written on the beauty context that depends on fundamentals and that Keynes believed that. Keynes is very popular to hijack important people for various causes. Keynes is a favorite one. <laughs> From New Keynesian model to... Keynes believed in fundamentals. And it's been documented 
I've written a chapter on the book that we published in 2011. He was not a behavioral economist. Yes, he did believe in psychology and believed in all these other things. He believed in the beauty context, all these other things, but he did believe in fundamentals. So that's the first part of the talk. The second part of the talk, if I get there, given the time, is to say that if we just give up the idea that we can, that, that we can represent the world as a pro pro stochastic process, we can have all of it and think about how to formalize it. The miracle in the field, and then I'll start, is how behavior economists manage to get it through. <laughs> That's the miracle. And why is that a miracle? The miracle is that they actually have empirical observations. And they said, if you ignore those empirical observations, we are going to miss a lot. But from when did empirical observation persuade an economist? We had a 2008 crisis in which the, in which the we had a 2008 crisis in which the DSG models fail. You're welcome to read Jody Galli or Olivia Blanchard. They'll tell you everything is fine. No problem. We just need to fix these things, very much like East European reformers, by the way. <laughs> so that's the problem that we face. Okay? But we're going to have to give up on something that is the 10th commandment. So let me go back to the beginning and tell you what this is about. So I'm not going to make an empirical argument, because I don't believe empirical arguments persuade economists. I agree with Ricardo that the empirical arguments, uh, they have to beat the model with the model. So I've worked a long time trying to beat the model with the model, and I can present the model, and we'll see whether we beat the model with the model. The work is with my wonderful Danish friends, uh, Seren Johansen, Anders Rabeck, and Morten Tabor. It's been a real experience in collaboration across fields, because they uh, happen to be hardcore mathematicians who develop stochastic models. And for me to persuade them that we have to go away from stochastic models and develop alternative mathematics would be as, was as easy as to persuade economists to take into account sociology. So I credit them with a great deal of flexibility and I'm grateful to them, actually. Okay? So I want to be very, as opposed to the general conversations, I want to be extremely clear, even at the cost of not completing, as to what we are talking about. I don't want to talk about some general things. I want to be very clear about all the terms we define, because I happen to believe and actually agree with Douglas that one of the, with the implicit thing that Douglas was talking about, Douglas Holmes, that one of the problems we have is actually language. <coughs> it's actually what we mean by rationality, what we mean by bounded rationality. So I want to be very clear, so at least you know what I mean by that. So if you want to evaluate it, you'll know what it is. So the first thing we want to say, we want to be clear about what we mean by nighty and uncertainty. And there are two aspects of 90 uncertainty that are critical. One is that change cannot be represented probabilistically. That's the most fundamental aspect. So it's not just about probability, as speaking of Rosemary's talk. It's not, it, there is a difference between t and t plus 1, because between t and t plus 1, things might change. So Knight would tell you that 90 uncertainty means that you have to worry about that they may change. And Knight's fundamental contribution that has been ignored and is now being brought back, has been brought back partially by Hans and Sarge in their book, Robustness. I will not have time to talk about it, but I will mention how this differs substantially from what they do. It was an attempt to bring that back in, into macro theory. And interestingly, Hans and Sarge also don't have change. Because in order to have 90 uncertainty and change, you have to have 90 uncertainty for an economist and for a policymaker. That's the difference. So if the economist can write the stochastic process, you can assume something for the agents, assume their loss averse, assume they have a minimum regret a la Gilboa. As long as you get back your stochastic process on the model, you're fine. Okay? So that's what I call disciplinary consensus. The disciplinary consensus is a consensus 
that something that doesn't describe the world as a stochastic process is not economics. That's commandment number 10. You remember Picard was looking for the 10th commandment. There is actually a 10th commandment. I would say it's the first commandment. Okay? I will argue very quickly now, over the next few minutes, without the math, <laughs> everything is in the paper and in the slides, you're welcome to look at it, that this consensus is what creates now an obstacle to macro theory. Mm -hmm. That is precise, that's my argument, it's very simple, very straightforward. And it's not a theoretical, it's not an empirical argument. I will say everything is abstract, I love abstraction, I don't think there's something wrong with RDH because it's abstract. I will not say any of this. I used to say that for many decades, that was my mistake. <laughs> and when I got nowhere, I finally thought that maybe that's not the way to go. I wrote many books arguing that, that it's empirically wrong and you need learning and you need mechanical models of learning. And I wrote a paper in 82, you, I did all of these things. And then I finally concluded that I couldn't be heard. So my first reaction was, as Edmund would say, a great deal of feeling that I was persecuted, but then I realized that maybe I was actually not right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I am now. Okay. So I'm going to look at two things that I've thought to be polar opposites, because that's what this conference is about. This talk applies to Hansen and Sargent, it applies to Phelps' micro foundations, it applies to the entire field, and actually I will write this up eventually, but this was hard enough. and and. That's where I'm going to start for the moment. Behavioral and REH, these two approaches are thought to be incompatible. In fact, the behavior economists say they look at fMRIs because they have to figure out why people forego all these profit opportunities. <laughs> because they obviously are irrational. I'm going to argue that there's no, nothing irrational about psychology. And it has to do with one of the very important questions that was asked, what about beliefs? in the study of the brain, and I'll make that very precise. I'm going to argue there's nothing irrational about it, and you can actually have the fundamental insight of REH that underpins REH. You have to throw out REH, but the insight is in Muth, who was, has been completely misread, including me, so when I, I spent a lot of time reading this thing, so it's not a criticism of others. And that's and, and that's what is preventing us to take the next step. Okay, so how do I argue that? So I'm gonna, since this is the model, being models with models, I have to have a model. And the, in a paper, by the way, that I submitted, there's an eight pages in which it's all in pure English, plain English, so if you ask David, you can read in English, you don't have to bother with the math. Make sure you go to the concluding remarks. Skip the math, but go to the concluding remarks. So it's the simplest possible model you can imagine. Okay? So it's the model in which just a simple arbitrage equation. Wait a second. How do I get the how do I get this uh, to po the pointer? Okay, so so here's the simple arbitrage equation that's five. Just as this is the equation that Rosemary had, that's a standard marker, it's an equation in every macro model, in every foreign exchange model, in a a new Keynesian model, anything you want. So this is, although it's a trivial stock price model, but it's actually the same model. There's one very important feature about that model, which differs from what Rosemary said, that because prices today depend on expectations tomorrow, then effectively prices today depend on expectations all the way into the future. That's very important. That's very important for thinking about macroeconomic theory. And then there's some simple uh, there's some simple uh, 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 there's some simple equations describing dividends. So the dividends and stock prices and the stock price. The dividend is just a function of one fundamental factor, earnings. This can be extended in any dimension, obviously. 
and the earnings for all random walk to facilitate the calculations. Note that I am not assuming that either the dividend process or the earning process are stationary in any way or <coughs> they, the coefficient on axis is BT, which changes over time in a way that is not pre-specified probabilistically to allow for naive uncertainty. And the, uh, the drift term in the log of earnings is also moving over time. So I'm going to use this model to present the, all the three approaches, the, mark, the REH behavioral, and then the alternative that we propose. OK? So what is the REH here? So the most important thing about REH is something that people are now anymore that we're unwilling to talk about is the elephant in the room, is that economic commandment. REH is based on the idea that people are rational. And that's very important to understand what that means because people who thought that they have behavioral stuff that is important have concluded that some people are irrational and that's what we have to understand. We have to understand where that came from. So what I, I take very simple, I'm a very simple-minded person, so I, I take rationality from the dictionary. <laughs> so the rationality in the dictionary means that people use some understanding of what they understand the world is, and they pursue goals. No, there's nothing here about that people don't care about social goals, they don't care about uh, uh, psychology, none of it. Just that they use rationality, that it's not a pure emotion. I can talk about what the evidence of this is that people always use some understanding. I've published a paper on this, that's not for now. Okay, so now we have a real problem and we have it the way the field went. So Muth understood that, at least in my reading, remember it's in my reading of Muth, it's a revisionist reading of Muth because I'm gonna support Muth, which is new for me. He understood that there is diverse understandings, that there are all these imaginations, as Richard would put it, and other people here. But he said, but we can't have a model in which there is no understanding. He even said something for a very simple reason, that if you want to understand the effects of policy, which is what Lucas understood Muthi's insight to be, you have to be able to say something about how what the individuals do connect to the way, as Muth put it, the way the economy works. So he says, let me propose something to you that is super extravagant, which has been misunderstood. He says, you know, when an economist writes down the model, what is the inherent premise of the model? Is that what you write down represents how the world works? Whatever it is. When you write the narrative paragraph, it represents how the world works. If you are a psychologist, it represents how the world That's what the model means. The model is in some sense an abstract representation of reality. So now I'm going to have a leap of faith, and I'm going to say, that's what he says, why don't we say that an economist is going to use his own understanding of reality to represent diverse understandings of reality of the participants? Now, that sounds completely far out. <laughs> and what he does with it, he says, why don't I illustrate this with a model in which my understanding of reality is a stochastic process? But that's where it goes wrong. So it goes wrong because, as I will argue, because of its night and uncertainty. If my model has night and uncertainty, I don't have one understanding of the future as an economist. And then or I can have psychology, I can have diversity, I can have consistency. So the Muthian insight becomes the fundamental insight to integrate everything we know in macro from Phelps to Hansen Sargent to behavior economics becomes a fundamental insight. And to, in order to do this integration, to do this synthesis, we need to do something. We have to open the model to Nike uncertainty that, that becomes actually a technical problem, how one does that. So that's the project. So. Okay, so let me just tell you what the implications are of of, of 
just applying Muthian hypothesis, I won't take you through this because I don't have the time, but the Muthian hypothesis is very powerful because it allows you to use the arbitrage equation in order to solve the model for prices as well, not just for the di expectation of dividends. It's an extremely powerful hypothesis. That hypothesis implies something that is very important, and there was a major contribution of the REH approach, that prices actually depend on fundamentals. The one of the hidden secrets of behavior economics is this idea that fundamentals really, they never said that, but that they really do not matter. But you know, if they didn't matter, why don't we just close financial markets? No one has ever advocated this. If they're really run by crazies, the best thing to do it would be to close them and replace them with central planning. We've tried that. It didn't quite work. <laughs> so uh, no one proposes this. So we better have a model in which fundamentals matter. So we can't have pure emotions. The question is, can we have emotions with fundamentals? And what is the exact, as Ricardo would say, exact functional role of having them? Right now, the REH, price earning ratios is constant. X is earnings, prices, theta is a constant. It's fully determined by the model. That's a very important feature of REH. It depends only on the parameters of the model. Obviously, this model is not going to work. You look at the price earning ratios. That's what Bob Schiller did, for which he got a Nobel Prize. It's all over the place. I hasten to add that that doesn't kill the REH models, which is what Bob didn't say. Because if I could represent change in a price earning ratio with probability distribution, like a Markov switching process, then the REH model is OK. So we have to argue more. We cannot just argue that we have change. We have to argue that we have change that is unforeseeable. If you think about it, it's obvious. But as I said, we're not going to rely on obvious empirical observations. Assuming that that's unforeseeable change means that if there's a new Fed chairman, we don't know, you don't know exactly what Fed's effects of Fed's policies are going to be. That's obvious. Of course, if you invent an iPad, you really don't know. So if you want to price the sector in the 80s with an infinite horizon model, you have to assume that iPad will be invented. <coughs> that's not going to be a great prediction. That's why economists don't like predictions. <laughs> OK? So now the behavior of finance. So we have five, I have five minutes? OK. I'll, I'll make it very short. Behavior of finance is a very simple proposition. You assume that there is a stochastic process. Therefore, what you have to have, you have had departures from REH. That was the point that was already made by Alan. Everything is biases against the, the benchmark. Behavior economists have said this is not full being not fully rational. I just said. That's due to Lucas, not to me. You have some people are grossly irrational forever. Not a surprise that even after the crisis, many macroeconomists said we need to fix the financial sector, but don't touch the DSG models. They look pretty good. They need to be fixed, but they look pretty good. Because the REH is really, we need to have the consistency. Okay? So that's not where it, where it lies. Okay? So I have, a, I, have a, I have exactly the same model as. David had yesterday and argued that it is, assumes gross irrationality. And you notice his answer to my question was that he, as an economist, knows that there was a, that there's going to be a, 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 an error, a mean reversion, but the agents don't know it. That's, that's, that's how you know you have a model, you have a strange methodology. And also that you're not going to explain it without it. So how do you do that? You have to open the model to Natian uncertainty. Since I have another three minutes, I will not tell you what it is. I knew that this is how it was going to end, because I can't make a case for something and present that something in 25 minutes. And, not and I thought making a case is more important. From the, I decided that. I, my original idea was that I just tell you what the new math is. But I, given the conference that so many people are interested in integrating these things, I thought I'll tell you what I think is the way to go. So what do you have to do? In order to do move, you have to have a model prediction. We have a little bit of a problem. Because if you don't have, if you don't have conditional expectation, you don't have a model prediction. And if you don't have a stochastic process, you don't have a conditional expectation. So you need a replacement. You need a different kind of <laughs> mathematics that allows you to make a prediction of a model in which an economist himself supposes that there are many, many myriad of futures that are ahead of him. 
if you just do that, there won't be economic theory. You have to bound the Nightian uncertainty. It can be a very wide bound. You have to bound the Nightian uncertainty. So, for example, in this trivial model, this is just a toy model, we assume that BT is within some B minus and B plus, and mu T is between mu minus and mu plus. B minus and B plus are all estimable from the data. And mu minus is a negative number, mu plus is a positive number. This is completely compatible with Nightian uncertainty because the mu and b can change in any way otherwise. So now I'll tell you one more thing and I stop. Okay? So what is the definition of Nightian uncertainty? The Nightian uncertainty is an interval at t plus k where d is going to lie given these constraints of the model. So the qualitative constraints of the model, they mathematically substitute for an extreme definition of a stochastic process. That's all you have to know. You need to worry about the math. So D could lie in an interval between B minus XT plus K and B plus XT plus K. And then you have a little bit of a problem because you cannot take an expectation of XT plus K because X is non ergodic and you cannot so, and you cannot take an expectation of BT because B is not encoded. So how do you do that? So the, in the paper, we have a, of course, technical paper, but even in this paper, I describe in the simple model how you can actually compute the expected interval which in which D would lie. And now I want to just give me a minute, I'll close. Okay, so the risk is just a standard risk of the innovation. The true uncertainty is that interval. They're actually both operating. That there's a risk and a true uncertainty in this model. Okay, so now the dividends are expected to lie within an interval like this that's computed in the paper. A number of things follow from this, and I need 30 seconds, and I promise. You can then compute prices. Maybe I should move straight to prices. So the price also lies in an interval. <coughs> and the, for the expected price lies in the interval. But the price itself lies in an interval that, 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 uh, that within some limits that are determined by the model. What is the implication of this? The implication of this is that if you want to model optimism or social interactions or anything you want, your creativity, you'll be, the, what this does, this makes the researchers and the agents autonomous. What REH does and the behavior approach does makes them be non-autonomous. The economist decides how interactions are modeled, does it precisely. The economist decides the exact version of rationality. Every model implies one version of rationality. There are many rational ways to do things. So where is the, so is the, where's the beef? Where, where is the psychology? Well, you can see where psychology is. The, the <coughs> expectation of the price relates to fundamentals like in REH, but the price earning ratio now is variable, is within the interval. This defines rationality. Why? Because the model defines a conception of how the world works under Nightian uncertainty. And therefore, Muthian insight tells us that that defines rationality in the context of the theory. Now, there's a degree of freedom. You can make the phi depend on any other influences that are not purely fundamental and get all kinds of predictions. And so now there's one point about predictions. So, so here's the change in price, 22. Now the change in price, I didn't have the time to, but in an REH model, all this phi and psi, they're all determined by the economies. That there's no, as Sajan br brilliantly put it, that beliefs of people are the outcomes of economies theorizing. We don't have that. We don't have that. So there are two influences. The first bracket is how individuals adjust their expectations. The second one is <laughs> fundamentals. And depending on how this, which one of these two factors dominate, you're going to get different predictions. So you actually get what we call contingent prediction. That comes from Popper. I didn't invent that. That you, you get two different predictions. The first one is contingent of future earnings increasing and the market being optimistic. That's very much what Ricardo was talking about, counterfactual. 
The model predicts that the stock price will appreciate. Second contingent of future earnings, the model predicts the price will fall. Now, you could say this is not verifiable. Now, it actually, if you take the narrative information in, say, Bloomberg report, you can actually, and we've done this, we've published this, you can actually try to get indexes of what it means that market is optimistic, and this model could be rejected. This model could actually be rejected. And, that, and now I overstay my welcome, and I appreciate your patience. <laughs>